And on that again. Oh, good. I've always been considered childish. Yeah, immature. No, childish, probably closer, not me. Number 22, magnify the Lord. Understand, it doesn't make sense in some ways, but it's true. The holiness of God, we are used by God to magnify that. So think about that. We can do that. We have that capability. It's what God asks us to do. Mary said that her soul magnified the Lord in Luke. So here we are, magnifying the Lord. Did you enjoy being ministered to by the uh, children of our Patch Club? Amen. Wasn't that good? That's so refreshing. Uh, thank you, workers who uh, minister to that uh, precious age group. Uh, your, your ministry is greatly appreciated by all of us. Take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading. And today we're going to read responsively. We don't do that every Sunday, but I will read the uh, verse 1 and the odd verses. I'd like for you to read verse 2 and the even verses, and we'll all join together on verse 14. The scripture references should be on the screen behind me. If you don't happen to have a copy of the King James Version of the Bible, there's a, a pew Bible there in the rack in front of you. Uh, I'd like for all of us to read from the same Bible so it doesn't sound quite like a charismatic assembly, okay? But uh, uh, let's all stand together and read responsively the scriptures. Have you got it? You ready? Okay. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the earth. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether.
Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them uh, there is great reward. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We have read the very word of God. Thank you. You can be seated. What a joy it is to greet each and every one of you here today. Uh, We are delighted that the Lord uh, led you uh, sovereignly, wonderfully to uh, worship together with us uh, today at uh, Victory Baptist Church. Excited for what God is doing in our fellowship and uh, excited to have you here today. Uh, As part of our ministry today, we have a, a missionary who is raising his support to minister in the Philippines. We're glad to have Josh uh, De La Rosa with us. And Josh will be presenting his ministry this evening in the evening service and ministering to our hearts. I want you to try and come back tonight for a meaningful ministry. Uh, Josh has uh, ministered to our teenagers this morning in Sunday school, and all of them have surrendered to the mission field. We're so thankful for that. And uh, he's going to be ministering to your children, ages four years old, through second grade in Children's Church, and they too will be surrendering to the mission field. Amen? Hopefully we all are surrendering to the mission field. Amen? When I pastored in uh, uh, Farmington, New Mexico, Grace Baptist Church, I like a little sign above the door, you are now entering the mission field. Amen? Amen? And we need to constantly keep that in mind. So, little little joke, but at the same time, there's truth to it. Uh, Hannah, you're still trying to get nursery helpers, right? Yeah, and we need help. Amen. So, please see Hannah if you can help with the nursery. Uh, Pastor Miles, you have a uh, uh, an announcement about a missions trip coming up. Yes, praise the Lord. We're uh, gearing up for another mission trip this year and um, working through COVID stuff and the restrictions, but it looks like we're able to do so. So we're planning to join uh, the Binoka's ministry in in the gospel safari, and that is uh, going school to school, going to orphanages, elementary school, high school, colleges, and being able to go share the gospel with those students. Uh, George right now is working very hard with principals, and he is getting permission for us to come in, and uh, he's planning for us to spend about a a day every week in the month of May in some type of school. Uh, So uh, just multiple times, multiple points of contact, and there's multiple opportunities for serving. Uh, This is not like the Philippines where you step in the, the classroom in 15 minutes to preach the gospel. It's more like you show up, you get there when you get there, and you've got all day with the students. And so there's going to be people giving their testimony, people, uh, if they have singing abilities, uh, maybe storytelling, maybe somebody's preaching, one-on-one discipleship. There's a lot of opportunity on this mission trip for everyone here uh, to participate in. So if you are interested in this mission trip, I want to give you more detail and what that's going to look like, cost, details, uh, COVID restrictions, all that good stuff. And I want to meet with anyone who is interested tonight at 530 so right before the evening service, come, if at all interested, come get more information and really be praying about it these next couple of weeks so that by the end of February, we can be purchasing tickets and we know exactly who's going and we can further plan and prepare that way. Uh, we're looking at about two weeks in May um, for those who are in 10th grade and through uh, older, through adults, uh, so everyone 10th grade and above is open, welcome to come, as long as you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you are at all interested in this mission trip or just want more details about it, come tonight for a very brief meeting. We'll get you those details and begin praying about that trip and the opportunity that God has for you through this. So come tonight, 530 in the fellowship hall. We'll get you that information and you can begin praying about it. Pastor? Amen. Amen. There was supposed to be in your bulletin a little insert about the business meeting coming up next Sunday night. I really want to encourage you to read through that. There's several very important items that we're going to be discussing, and uh, all of those are in print there for you. Please take advantage of the bulletin 
to inform yourself, okay? Uh, amen. Uh, I uh, would appreciate your prayers. I'm going to be traveling to Greeley tomorrow, coming back on Tuesday evening, uh, Tuesday morning. I have a preaching assignment. My least favorite preaching assignment is to preach to preachers. That is the toughest crowd that ever existed, it is a group of pastors. Probably the only thing harder is preaching to their wives. <laughs> yeah, I, can, can I spend the night somewhere tonight with someone? <laughs> At any rate, we're, we're going to have a, a good time at the Foundation Baptist Fellowship meeting in Greeley. I really would appreciate your prayers for safety as I travel, and I've got a burden that I'd like to get off of my heart. I'd like to deliver to the men tomorrow or on Tuesday, so appreciate your prayers for that. Well, last week, our church took care of some great business, which is a delight. Uh, the, the church family, uh, by a, a strong and healthy percentage, uh, invited Pastor Roland Casales to follow my ministry. I'm retiring uh, July 25th uh, as your senior pastor, and on July 26th, Roland Casales will be your, uh, your new pastor. And so uh, uh, we thank God, Roland, that you accepted that uh, invitation. And uh, I, I want to commend our pulpit committee. I want to commend all of you as the body of Christ for your uh, uh, participation uh, uh, Sunday night in, in the uh, question and answer time. And I certainly want to praise God for uh, answering our prayers. And uh, we still have many prayers that need to be answered uh, between now and then. And we know that God is going to give us good and, and godly leadership. Is there anything else that I'm supposed to announce? All right. I'm going to uh, dismiss the children's worker. Brother uh, Josh, we're delighted to have you. And thank you for ministering to our children. This is the finest group of children anywhere in the world. They are. You, you, you're, you're in for a treat, buddy. You're in for a treat. Four years old through... Uh, second grade, you can go with Josh. Go on back to the back and go to Children's Church at this time. Amen. Ron, come and lead us in that last song. Number 167. 167. This fits because I wanted to remind us that Jesus himself is also holy and that we um, should view him as wonderful, wonderful. I'd also like to say that, and I know Marty remembers, we used to have that same sign over that door right there that said, you're now entering the mission field every time you walked out of the church. Somebody took it down. I don't know who did. Somebody. We haven't found him yet. Number 167.
Amen. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's been a while since I got to preach, really, and you just hogged this pulpit the last couple of weeks. I'll tell you what. Did a good job. Thank you for opening the Word of God to us. And uh, my heart is, is, is full. We're almost through. 17 years in the book of Isaiah? No, I, I, think, it's, I think it's been two, two. We, we just now are starting that third year. And uh, we are in chapter 63, so you can start heading that way. We're going to be looking at just three verses today, verses 7, 8, and 9. Uh, and this is part of a uh, larger section that actually goes through the end of chapter 64. But some of you are pretty smart. You've already figured out that we're getting near the end of Isaiah. It's only got 66 chapters, right? And uh, some so, Pastor, what are you going to do when you're finished with Isaiah, knowing that your senior pastor ministry, your pulpit ministry, is going to be ending on uh uh, July 25th. Well, I, I'm seriously considering the book of uh, Ezekiel, and uh, uh, no, not at all. I'm not at all serious about that. I, uh, I honestly don't know what I'm going to do at this point. I love to preach through books of the Bible and study them with you. It enables me as your pastor to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The study of Isaiah has just enriched my own walk with the Lord, uh, my appreciation of who he is and all that he does, and I hope that it's been an encouragement to your faith and your faithfulness uh, to Christ, uh, but I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. I, I began my pulpit ministry here preaching through two uh, small books, one in the uh, New Testament, one in the Old Testament then. We went through Philemon together as a church family those first few weeks, and then I went through the Old Testament book of Ruth together with you. I'm tempted to end that way. I, I don't know, I, I, but I don't know what I'm going to do. I, uh, but I know this, I'm going to preach the Word of God, okay? I am going to preach the Word of God uh, in season, out of season. This is the, the only book that I know how to preach from is the Word of God, so... Uh, I'd, I'd like to do uh, some type of a book study with you, just not sure where I'm going with that. I still have a responsibility to be mentoring two young men. I thank God for Pastor Yarnell and Pastor Casales, and I want to continue to give them opportunities to preach. So just pray that God will give me wisdom, give you wisdom, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, in these days we just uh, uh, continue to race together toward uh, the mark of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus for all of us. Amen? All right. Uh, Isaiah chapter 63, this is kind of an interesting portion. For, uh, the first six verses, you remember three weeks ago I dealt with the ultimate uh, avenger, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and he is coming back to establish his kingdom on earth, but he is also coming to judge those who refuse to accept him as their own personal Lord and Savior. It's a very sobering passage, verses 1 through 6, which leads then to a heart reaction. In light of God's future judgment, Isaiah is joined in, in verses uh, 7 uh, of chapter 63 through verse 12 of chapter 64 with all of the nation of Israel. In, in light of the fact that there is a God that we have to answer to, they come to God in what we call a prayer of lament. And it's a community prayer. It's just not Isaiah's prayer. It's a prayer of those who know and love God. And uh, in this prayer, there's a, 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 there is a beginning of, uh, of worship and praise, and that's what we're going to be focused on. That's verses 7, 8, and 9. And, and then that goes to an acknowledgment of their sin. We have rebelled against you, God. And because of that rebellion, there is a sorrow for their sin, and then there's a confession of their sin and a pleading with God to work in their individual and national lives. But it begins with praise. It begins with praise. And those first few words in verse 7, I will make mention. 
Uh, this is kind of what you do when you get together with an extended family. I, I love getting together with extended family because sometime when we're all together at some meal, we're all going to take a, a, a stroll down memory lane together, aren't we? It, have, you've done that as a family? And, and you start sharing what you did like when you were a kid and, and your mother and father's mouths drop and I, you did, I didn't know you did that. And, and, and there's laughter and there is joy and, and, and there's this time of uniting together around who we are as a family. And this prayer of lament seriously deals with their national sin of rebellion against this holy God that Ron led us to worship this morning. But it begins with the family sharing their joy. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we look into these three verses of praise, okay? Heavenly Father, we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. And as your family, when we come into your presence, invariably we break out into praise. It is a natural thing for the heart of a Christian to pause and, and, and to reflect on your goodness to us. We are overwhelmed by your grace. Father, I pray that today you would encourage the heart of each and every believer. And Lord, I, I pray if there's someone here with us today that has not yet put their faith or their trust in Jesus Christ, that this would be the, the day of salvation for that individual. Lord, we love you. And we, we uh, are, are simply bathing in the ramifications of your great love for us. Uh, Lord, may the Spirit of God be our great teacher, and may Jesus be honored and glorified is our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, let me read the text, then I want to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, some of the, the highlights of verse 7, 8, and 9, and then we'll get into the text, okay? We, we have a little bit of Bible study uh, after we do all the explaining, we're going to do a little Bible study because you're okay with Bible study, right? And, and then I'll actually preach a message, all right? We will get to a message eventually. Let me begin in verse 7. I will make mention, I will remember the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people. Children that will not lie. The idea there is not that they ever tell a lie, but children that will uh, not deal falsely. They will be truthful uh, to me. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, be comforted with these words, saying, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Now, now he's going to uh, confess his sin in the very uh, the next phrase of, of, of verse 10. But they rebelled. That, that, that's the sin of the nation. They rebelled. And so often that's our sin of, uh, uh, stubbornly refusing to surrender to the sweet will of, of our sovereign God. But they begin with praise. And, and I deliberately read verse 7 the way that it kind of flows be, because verse 7, it, it, it's almost as if this is a volcano eruption of praise. I will make mention... I will remember the, the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. Can, can you see this kind of just, Lord, you're worthy of praise. That's what he's saying in verse 7. I, th I think we get that, don't we? It, it, it's almost as if he doesn't want to stop. 
Lord, you are good, and you do good. And then in verse 10, he acknowledges his relationship. Uh, excuse me, uh, the, the prophet is acknowledging God's relationship as God says certain things with Israel. And, and he says to them, I chose you. You are my people. And, and uh, you will not lie. You, he, he's referring back to what's recorded in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 24, if you want to jot it down, you can check it out on your own. And, and, and Moses had brought the words of God and, 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 and what God expected of them. And they said, everything that God said, we're going to do that. We, and, and they fully intended to do that. And, and Moses saw, had sacrifices offered. And from some of the blood of that sacrifice, he sprinkled the entire congregation. And they entered in to the best of their knowledge and to the best of their ability into a covenant with a holy God. But by the way, some of you have put your faith in Christ, but you're struggling with if you're really saved or not. Can I say that your salvation does not rest on how well you're doing, but on how well God does? Do we understand that? Because if it were left up to you and me, we, none of us would make it. But we have a faithful God who recognizes when a sinner sincerely puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they, they become his child, and he is their father. Uh, verse 10 is where it gets real interesting. He, he assures us of his love for us. In, in, in their affliction, God was what? God was afflicted. And, and then he says something that just... We, we have a tendency to kind of just read over these phrases and, and we need to just stop and say, hold the phone, what, what's he talking about here? The angel of his presence saved them. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that phrase, I, I, I did a, okay, what's he talking about moment here? Uh, who in the world is this angel of God's presence? Literally, the phrase could be translated this way, the, the angel towards his face. The angel toward his face. Now, normally when we read the angel uh, in the Bible or an angel of the Bible, we're thinking of a messenger of God, aren't we? And we would be correct to think so. But in our New Testament, we are introduced to a very unique angel. In fact, I did a Sunday night series several years ago on the angel of the Lord. And we are exposed to the fact that this angel of the Lord is no mere ordinary angel. In our text, he's called the angel of his presence, the angel uh, who's, uh, uh, who is towards the face of, of God. This is an angel who is always towards the face of God. And we know from this text that this angel saved the nation of Israel. Is anybody curious of who he's talking about here? Now, we're going to do a Bible study before we get in the message because it's important for us to know who this angel is. Maybe you don't want to know. We'll just kind of close it and go. Does anybody want to know? Okay, three of you. That's good enough for me. I, I, I can deal with three. I can deal with three. This angel is saved the nation is uh, first introduced to us in this national context back in Exodus chapter 23. So turn there with me, Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23, and God is speaking, uh, and notice there in verse 20, and if you have a translation that may actually capitalize the word angel, how many in your translation, verse 23, the word angel is capitalized? Can I see your hand? All right. Isn't that cool? Then you've got the correct edition of the scripture there. All right. Behold, I will send an angel, capitalized, before thee 
to keep thee in the way. Now, the children of Israel have left Egypt. They've been redeemed by uh, the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. Uh, they've been bought by God as his own people. They are now, uh, they've crossed over the Red Sea uh, on dry ground. The Egyptian uh, army has been uh, devastated, and they're in the wilderness. They're at the base of Mount Sinai. And, and God is saying, I am going to send an angel. And this angel is going to go before you. And his job is to keep thee in the way. And his job is to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. This angel is going to bring you all the way into the promised land. Now notice, God says some interesting things about him in verse 21. First of all, you better fear him. Beware of him is what the text says, right? Fear him. Uh, obey him. Do not provoke him. Uh, are you getting the idea that this angel may be more than just not one of the ordinary angels? Huh? And, and then the next phrase should really, really capture your attention on the identity of this angel. Because it says, beware of him, obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Wait a minute. Who is the only being that has power and the right to pardon sin, to forgive sin? That's God, isn't it? That's God. And then he says, here's the reason. My name is in him. Whoa! We're talking about an angel who is more than just an ordinary angel. This is a messenger of God. This is someone who communicates God. This is someone who is in the presence of God, who, who is face to face with, with God. He must be listened to. You must fear him. You should not provoke him. And if you disobey him, he will not forgive you. Wow. Let's go on. He says there in verse 23, mine angel shall go before thee, and he will bring you into this land of promise. Wow. Now, if you're Moses, and none of you are, but if you were Moses, this doesn't take you by surprise. This revelation of God's special angel, you have already dealt with, haven't you? Right? Right? Exodus chapter 3, turn there if you will. Exodus chapter 3. So who is this angel of his presence? Who is this angel who is always before the face of our God? Exodus chapter 3, Moses was not surprised by God's revelation of this angel in Exodus chapter 23 because Moses has already encountered this angel in Exodus chapter 3. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his uh, father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, and the, what class? Angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Looked and, and, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And, 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 and Moses, he's, he's kind of disturbed by this, as you would be. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord. Jehovah, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, when Jehovah said, I will now, uh, uh, Jehovah saw that he turned aside. God called on him in the midst of the bush. Wait, in verse 2 it says the angel of the Lord was in that burning bush. In verse 4 it says it's Jehovah speaking. It's the voice of God speaking. There in verse 6, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen thee, what? In their affliction, Isaiah says. God was afflicted. He saw their faith. Who is this angel of the Lord? This angel of the Lord is Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. He, he is afflicted with their afflictions. 
This angel of the Lord is the same angel of the Lord that, that, that God said is going to lead you into the promised land in Ezekiel, uh, Exodus chapter 23. This is the same angel of the Lord who appears to Moses out of the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. It's the same angel of the Lord in Genesis 16 and 21 who ministers to Hagar when she recognizes that this angel is the God who sees her. This is the angel of the Lord who appears to Abram when he offers up Isaac on Mount Moriah. And God stays his hand and he provides a lamb for himself. And his name is called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord shall provide. This angel of the Lord is the ultimate messenger of God. Yes, he is a messenger. In fact, when we read of him in the New Testament, and John wants to expose us to Jesus, he exposes him as the Word. This is the Word who was in the beginning with God and was God. So we've done a little Bible study, okay? Now, how about a message? What is the message? I thought it was important for you to know who that angel of the Lord was because I was blessed by it, and I wanted to share it with you. But that's not the message, although that would be a good one. Roland, you could preach that one, okay? You know what we have here in these three verses is just an anthem of praise. And God gives to us in these three verses five biblical reasons why his people can praise him. Why should you praise God? Why is he worthy of praise? And I just want to go through these with you quickly, okay? First reason is found in verse 8. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 8. God said, surely they are my people. The first reason that you and I as Christians ought to praise God is because God chose us. They are my people. People. Last Sunday, uh, Roland led us in a, a study of uh, uh, Psalm 100. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God chose us. That's wonderful. I don't know how many of you ever were chosen for anything. Anybody here ever get chosen for anything? How many of you got married? Anybody? You got chosen by somebody, didn't you? Uh, that was good. Amen? How many of you ever tried to compete maybe with all the kids in the neighborhood on a baseball team? How many of you had the, uh, the, the, uh, the you, you picked two captains and you had a baseball bat? And one captain would throw the bat to the other guy and he would grab it and, and then they would do hands and, and then finally fingers and then the other guy would have the opportunity to kick the bat and see if it would go out of there. And that was, guy got the first what? First pick. First pick. You ever get first pick? Me neither. But I can remember the first time I got chosen. Man, I wanted to learn to play baseball. I'm a kid about six, seven years old, me and my friend Gary Scott. Gary had a big brother named Harold, and, and we wanted to play baseball with the big boys in the neighborhood. And, and they'd never choose us. Nobody would ever pick us. And, and one week, Harold worked with us. He got a, we got our baseball gloves, and he would throw the baseball at us, and we would finally catch it. And, and then we'd... Learned to, to hold the bat right, and he'd throw the ball, and we'd learn to hit. And the next time we had a neighborhood game and all the kids showed up, Harold said, these two guys get picked. i let you know I got picked last. <laughs> but thank God I got picked. You know why God picked you? It had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with God. That's why you should praise him. God didn't pick you because you're smarter than someone else. God didn't pick you because uh, you, you have more money than someone else or because uh, you, you are uh, Harvard or, or, or Yale educated. Don't we live in a messed up world? God picked you because God chose to pick you. I, I don't understand all of that. I, I see it explained in the nation of Israel's case in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Turn there, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 7. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 7. This kind of humbles the nation of Israel. Wait till we read the New Testament. It'll humble you even more, okay? But God chose the nation of Israel. Listen to what God said. 
The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any uh, people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your father, he brought you out with a mighty hand. Why did God choose them? Because he loved them. And he's a God that keeps his word. That's why. I don't understand all that. He, he could have chosen Russia. By the way, he did not choose the United States of America to be the land of promise and the people of promise. He didn't choose Ireland. He didn't choose Kenya. He chose Israel as his people. Why? Because he's God. And he sovereignly chose to love them, and he wanted to keep his word that he made to Abraham. Isn't that good? What about New Testament? Are you ready to be humbled? No. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is glorying in the message of the cross of Jesus Christ and all that Jesus did for sinners so that you and I could have a relationship with God. Think about it. God wants to have a relationship with you and with me, and he does it all through the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath called, verse 7, be humbled, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are are. Why? So that no flesh of glory in uh, the, the, no flesh of glory in his presence, verse 31, so that all of us, if we glory, we glory in the Lord. I don't know why God chose me. I don't. I, I remember years ago reading R.C. Sproul's book, and I encourage you to read it. It'll just bless you. I, I, I'm not a Calvinist, but he's explaining the doctrines of Calvin and that. The book is called Chosen of God. And literally, when I finished reading that book, I was all alone. I was studying uh, uh, for my master's degree. I, I was on campus at uh, uh, the Chicago campus of Moody Bible Institute. I was by myself. I was in my room. I finished that, reading that book. I remember getting on the side of my bed and just weeping with joy that there's a God in heaven who chose me to be saved. Really, if you're saved today, you're saved because God chose you. You say, well, what if I'm not saved? then trust him and show that he chose you. Amen? Don't make it hard. Come to him. Why should we praise him? He says to Israel, you're praising me because you're my people. I chose you. I chose you. Rejoice in that. Can you think of what an encouragement that was to the people of the New Testament? If you were a New Testament Christian, you came out of either a Jewish background or a pagan background, and from both backgrounds, your people despised you. You were treated as the, the Apostle Paul says, the offscoring of the earth, the garbage dump of humanity. You weren't picked for that little neighborhood baseball team. Could you imagine what they felt? when they read in their Bible that God, before he said, let there be light, the God who cannot lie said, I chose you. Can you praise that God? Oh, you ought to be able to praise the God who says, I chose you. Not only did he choose us, but look there in the, the, the text back in Isaiah chapter 63, and you could preach a whole message from this sometime, the first part of verse 9, in all their affliction, in all their affliction, Israel have any affliction? 400 years of slavery, affliction, moaning, groaning, being abused, victims of justice, victims. In all of their affliction, what does the scripture say? God Almighty was afflicted. Listen to me. Second reason you can praise God is this is a God who cares. He is deeply, deeply impacted by what you are going through. 
when I was a child, one of the first scripture verses I learned, maybe one of the first ones you learned was from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Are you sure of God's care for you? You say, I don't know where God is. I'm going through some dark waters and uh, deep waters and, 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 and dark times in my life. And pastor, I, I just don't. He, he's afflicted. He cares. The psalmist uh, David said that he takes all of our tears and, and they're, they're collected in his bottle. Now, I didn't understand that until I was at Bob Jones University. They used to have a museum there at Bob Jones University. that showed some ancient artifacts. And they had something I never saw before on the shelves at Walgreens. It was called a tear bottle. When people were going through heartaches, maybe they'd lost a loved one. Uh, uh, maybe they, they'd heard bad news, but their heart response was to cry. The, the ladies would collect their tears in a bottle. It was a precious time, a time of remembering loss. Are you suffering, dear child of God? Are you being afflicted? God has captured every one of your tears. It's in his bottle. He hasn't let one reach the ground. You feel like your heart's broken? God is afflicted with you. He that spared not his own son, Romans 8.32 tells us, shall not with him also freely give us all things. He cares. He chose you. He cares for you. Can you praise that God? This is not some plastic God that we put on a shelf. This is not some isolated God who is so far above us that he's not concerned with your prayers. This is a God who hears and answers the prayers of his people. He loves you. Wow. Third reason, we, we did a Bible study on this. Anybody remember a Bible study on the angel of his presence? Okay, good. Two of you do. That's good. Well, I started with three, and we, you know, at least two-thirds of them got it. That's pretty good. Third point, the angel of his presence. We praise God because he came for us. The angel of his presence is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came to Hagar in the Old Testament before Jesus was born in a manger. That boggles my mind. He was always the Son of God, and He always was God. He came to Abraham on Mount Moriah. He, he is the one who, who uh, 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 Jacob would say has redeemed me from all of my troubles in, in Genesis chapter 48. This is the angel of the Lord who appears uh, in the burning bush before Moses. This is the angel that God promised would lead his people all the way into the promised land. And this is the word, according to John chapter 1, verse 14, who became flesh and dwelt among us. He came. I thank God that he came. Emmanuel, God with us. John never got over it. Turn to 1 John. First John, look and see how he begins that little letter to encourage people to have fellowship with him and fellowship with the Father and fellowship with the Son. Look at the, look at the sensory words that he uses in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which we have, oh, we heard him, which we have see, we, we saw him was we, we saw which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested. He came, we saw it, we saw the life, we bear witness, and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. John is saying, I, I can't get over Jesus coming. He came. He came, and he came on purpose to seek and to save. That which is lost. Oh, Jesus, thank you for coming for sinners like me. Fourth reason that we can praise God. It's found in verse 9. It says, in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. The nation of Israel was bought by God. Can I say, you and I have also been bought by God. He claimed us. 
He claimed us as his own. Not only did he choose us, but he paid for us. He redeemed us out of all of our sin through the blood work of Jesus Christ. I like what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 record for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much then, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed, that we, we, we were not bought by God with corruptible things. I like what he says about corruptible things. Silver and gold, you know, stuff like silver and gold. You're, you're much more valuable than the silver and gold, friend. In order to redeem you, God had to die. God had to shed his blood. It says we weren't redeemed from this old way of life that we got from our fathers by silver and gold, but in verse 19 contrast, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You and I, bought by God, claimed by him. Can, can you praise God because he chose you, because he cares for you, that he came for you, and friend, because he claimed you, he bought you. You are his. You are bought with a price. Now, now, now that ought to change us a little bit, amen? We're not free to live our lives in any old libertarian way we want to. Oh, rugged individualist way. Be a rugged, be the person you are. I'm glad that we're not all clones of one another. Amen? Carbon copies. But oh, that we would recognize that we want to glorify God in our body and our soul, which belong to God because God bought us with the blood of Christ. He's claimed us. I am His. At the end of Bible camp, every once in a while, we, we do the claiming of the stuff left in the bathroom routine. Who left? And, and there's some stuff you just don't want to hold up. And nobody claims them. I, I don't care how often I've been to Bible camp. I guarantee you, been to junior camp year after year after year. And, and, and I, could, I could start selling boys' underwear. Them boys never claim it. I don't know who lost it, but somebody did, and there's a stack of them when we're done with Bible camp. Nobody claims those things. <laughs> Some of you maybe uh, used to be like my mom. Mom always worked. The big day of the year was Christmas for my mom and grew up as a poor uh, sharecropper kid in Arkansas and probably didn't have much of anything. And uh, she'd, she'd put things on layaway. Anybody here have a mom that put things on? How many of you still? Yeah. And, and what do you do? You eventually come in and you, you claim it. You finish paying the price. It's yours. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Can we praise him? You're his. One of the great joys I have as being your pastor is to know this. You're not mine. You're not my problem. <laughs> you, you are God's. Amen? He is, he's claimed you. He paid that price. And we can praise him. The last reason, he finishes verse 9. He bore them. He bare them. He, 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 he put them on his shoulders and he carried them all the days of old. Friend, we can praise God because He carries us. He carries us. You, you know, I am absolutely confident that someday I'm going to see Jesus. You know why I'm confident of that? It's not because I'm carrying Him. It's because He's carrying me. He's got me. Turn to the next, the last book of the Bible, the little book of Jude, and see how Jude ends up this epistle, this little letter where he's warning people about perilous people, dangerous people in dangerous times. Anybody here feel like we're living in dangerous times? And sometimes we get a little overwhelmed and we get concerned, so much concerned that we're overwhelmed with anger or fear and we just don't know what God's doing and 
And Jude is writing to people just like you and me, dangerous people in dangerous times, and he ends it this way. Jude chapter, excuse me, yeah, Optimus, chapter 24. Verse 24. Now, unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to prevent you, uh, present you faultless before the, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And how do I know? How do, how do I have confidence I'm going to make it? Because I have a God who is carrying me. He, he picked me up. He bore me up. And he carried me as he did the nation of Israel in days of old. He's carrying me and he's carrying you. You're going to make it. Not because you're really sharp or you've you got a, a, a stubborn will and boy, nobody's going to. No, you, you're going to make it because God saved you and God is going to keep you and God is going to present you before his throne to his glory, to his honor, and to his ultimate praise. There's five good reasons for you and I to praise God today. Amen? Now, if you need more, we'll study some more later, okay? But from this text, from this passage, God says, I want your praise. I want your praise because I, I chose you. I chose you. And not only did I choose you, I, I, I'm the God who... Uh, 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 who, who cares for you. I was in your affliction, I'm affliction. And, and, and I am the God who has loved you. I'm the God who came for you. I'm the God who claimed you. And I'm the God who will carry you all the way home. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given it to us, and we've got to study it today. Pray, Lord, that you would use it for your glory, use it for your honor. And Father, may we be a people who praise you. We love you. We are overwhelmed with your goodness. And Father, help us to be that people of praise that continue to not only bring you glory and honor, but reflect that glory and honor so that others might come to know our God as well. Perhaps as I finish this prayer, maybe there's someone here this morning that says, Jim, I, I realize today that Jesus did purchase me, but I, I, I've never acknowledged him. I've never trusted him as my own Lord and Savior. Jim, would you pray for me? I want to praise God. But today, I, I know my first need is to trust Jesus. I need to be saved. Could I pray for you? Would you slip up your hand wherever you are? Is there anyone like that at all? A man or a woman, teenager, child? Maybe as a person of God, a child of God, you say, today, Jim, my heart's been burdened. But I, I see today that one of the things I always need to do is praise my God. God's spoken to me about issues where I can praise him. I, I want to use what I learned today to praise my God better. If that is so, could you slip up your hand and let me pray for you? Amen. Thank you. Yes. Lord, be glorified here in the assembly of your saints, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together. Ron? Number 480. 480. We we'll always end the service uh, by extending a public invitation because uh, many times there are decisions that need to be made public in the body, and uh, there are other decisions that 
folk just need help with. And we always try and give you an opportunity to do what God would have you to do. So today as we sing 480 on that first word of the first stanza, we're only going to sing the first stanza, come, deal with God, okay, if you need to, all right? Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. We, we want to praise the Lord. That, that's a good thing to do. All right. Well, let's uh, praise him with our love, okay? I love you, Lord. God bless. You're dismissed. Amen.